So we will be continuing our series in the kings of Judah. So now we move on to some of the lesser known ones. Um, quick, who's Abijah and Abijam? Yay, thank you, kings of Judah. <laughs> I can even see that's not quite right because it's a king of Judah. <laughs> so not one of our common kings. Asa, what do we know about Asa? Not much. Alan was able to give me immediately one of the key remembrance points about Asa. Ah, bad feet. So we're going to be looking at both Abijah and Asa. So Abijah, Abijam are two names for the one king. Um, and we will talk a little bit about why two names. Um, so a bit of a recap. So we now are in the divided kingdom. So a couple of weeks ago, we had Rehoboam, who resulted in the divided kingdom. Um, so Judah and Israel now, um, try to do a comparison and so worship. So Jeroboam instigated the golden calves and the idol worship in Israel, primarily as a political tool. So the people wouldn't go back to Jerusalem and start thinking about how good it would be to be under the one king again. And that really poisoned Israel for the rest of its history. That throughout the history of Israel, it then was tied to idol worship. And that one act out of political desires led to really the key problem of Israel. Judah, trying to do the comparison, I'm but Levitical worship, yes, they had lots of problems and lots of idol worship throughout their history. But the Levites came to Judah. They came to Jerusalem to continue the temple worship. And the kings mostly had at least some sort of acknowledgement that the temple and God was important, even if they were idol worshippers themselves. There are a number of kings who led revivals and which revitalized the nation and consequences. So Judah had the Davidic lineage. And so the family of David ruled in Judah practically throughout their entire history and led to the prophecy of Jesus being from the Davidic line. Israel, not so much. So they ended up with nine ruling families, only over 200 years. There was a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of turnover. Uh, there was lots of revolts and assassinations and murders. Kings didn't last long. So Israel lasted for 200 years before they were taken away into captivity. Judah for about 350 years before they were taken away into captivity. Oh, both of them for the same problem. They didn't follow God, and they lent towards idol worship. There were 19 kings in Israel and 20 in Judah over that period of time. And yeah, 18 of the kings of Israel were judged as being evil. And one only gets a sort of vague pass because he did what God wanted him to do when he became king and then was evil for the rest of his reign. Whereas 12 of the kings of Judah were judged as being evil. There is a reason why Judah practically doubled its length of time against Israel. There were revivals. The people turned back to God. The kings led the people back to God at times. And God blessed them when they did that. And the kingdom lasted longer. Oh, but it was still more than half were judged as evil. And out of the remaining eight, um, two of them were 
only good for part of the time, and judged evil at the end of their lives. So things did not go well for the history of Judah and Israel. We had God promised Abraham a land and a people. And then they went into captivity in Egypt. And God rescued them. He brought them out. He gave them the land. After they murmured and complained and he had to let one generation die. He gave them the land. And they turned away. And they fell away. So we're actually doing judges in the young adults Bible study. And the refrain was, and the people did evil in the sight of the Lord, and God brought X nation against them. And some number of years later, the people cried out, and a judge was raised to redeem them. So the kings were not God's desire. But with David, it was a new start for the nation. It was a new opportunity to start following God with a king who desired to follow God. And Solomon followed on after him. But then, yes, Solomon turned away in his last years. And then Rehoboam, who was not wise, and who split the kingdom. So very shortly after, the nation had the opportunity to restart as a nation following God, a nation under God's control through their king, they soon drifted away. So let's turn to Second Chronicles chapter 13. So despite the fact that, yeah, these are not two really well-known kings, there's an amazing amount of words written about them in the Bible. Compared to some other kings, one commentary noted, there's two of the Israelite kings. We know from other historic sources, they were the two most important kings of Israel. They have the least amount written about them in the Bible. So, starting from verse 1. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, Abijah began to reign over Judah. He reigned for three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel the Gibeah, of Gibeah. Now, there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. Abijah went out to battle, having an army of valiant men of war, 400,000 chosen men. And Jeroboam drew up his line of battle against him with 800,000 chosen mighty warriors. Then Abijah stood up on Mount Zemariam, that is in the hill country of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, O Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought you not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingship over, to, over Israel forever to David and his sons by covenant of salt? Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, a servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord. And certain worthless scoundrels gathered about him and defied Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and irresolute and with, could not withstand them. So, I'm using the English Standard Version, irresolute. It's probably a polite way of saying not very wise and young and foolish. Verse 8. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David, because you are a great multitude and have with you the golden calves that Jeroboam made you for gods. Have you not driven out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and made priests for yourselves like the people of other lands? Whoever comes for ordination with a young bull or seven rams becomes a priest of what are no gods. But as for us, Lord is our God. And we have not forsaken him. We have priests ministering to the Lord who are sons of Aaron and Levites for their service. They offer to the Lord every morning and every evening burnt offerings and incense of sweet spices set out on the showbread on the table of pure gold. 
and care for the golden lampstands that as the lamps may burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Behold, God is with us at our head, and his priests with their battle trumpets to sound the call to battle against you. O sons of Israel, do not fight against the Lord, the God of your fathers, for you cannot succeed. Jeroboam had sent an ambush round to come up upon them from behind. Thus his troops were in front of Judah, and the ambush was behind them. And when Judah looked, and behold, or when Judah looked, behold, the battle was in front of and behind them. And they cried to the Lord, and the priests blew the trumpets. Then the men of Judah raised the battle shout. And when the men of Judah shouted, God defeated Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. The men of Israel fled before Judah, and God gave them into their hand. Abijah and his people struck them with great force, so there fell slain of Israel 500,000 chosen men. Thus the men of Israel were subdued at that time, and the men of Judah prevailed, because they relied on the Lord, the God of their fathers. And Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took cities from him. Bethel with its villages, and Jeshana and with its villages, and Ephron with its villages. Jeroboam did not recover his powers in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him down, and he died. But Abijah grew mighty, and he took 14 wives and had 30, 22 sons and 16 daughters. The rest of the acts of Abijah and his ways and his sayings are written in the story of the prophet Iddo. So this sounds like a revival. Rehoboam. He occasionally listened to a prophet, but was not considered a good or wise king. His son, Abijah. Oh, his name? Yahweh is father, is what Abijah means. We're seeing that example here. He is trusting in God. The context we're assuming is he's fairly young. He's a new king. And Jeroboam is taking the opportunity to say, there's only two tribes. They're a small group. We can take them. We'll get the whole kingdom. I'll take over. Abijah reasons with Israel. He says, God has ordained. The sons of David will remain on the throne. Don't fight against us. You cannot win. He's pleading with them not to bring the battle. But Jeroboam is looking at them and saying, we outnumbered them two to one. This is easy. Oh, what does Jeroboam mean? His name is the people contend, in which fits his nature very well. He's contending. So they line up for battle. Jeroboam puts together a strategy, which is a pretty sound military strategy. We outnumber them far more than they do. It's easy for us to put up this vast army in front of them, plus spin out who knows how many, doesn't tell us, but quite possibly a very large number to come up behind them. We capture them in a classic military ambush. Abijah trusted in God. What happens with the brilliant military strategy? Verse 14, And when Judah looked, behold, the battle was in front and of and behind them, and they cried to the Lord. So they asked God for help. They were in trouble. They would have known that really there was no human way they could possibly withstand. But they sought God's help, and God responded. God delivers them, but they cry to the Lord. The priests blew their trumpets. The men of Judah raised the battle shout. And then the key message is, and God defeats Jeroboam, and all Israel. 
Abijah trusts in God. And God honors that. He honors his motives. We are standing for battle to protect the kingdom of Israel promised to David and his sons. He honors his faith. Abijah trusted that God would deliver despite the odds being heavily stacked against him. And God delivers. Jeroboam relied on his strength. And God defeats him. We need to rely on God, not our own strength. And the end is, Jeroboam relied on his strength. And when he's defeated, he never recovers. But a few years later, he dies. But Abijah grew mighty. Oh, and then the bad news is the last verse. And he took 14 wives. Oh, yes, weren't we told they weren't supposed to do that? So he grew mighty and possibly a little proud and overconfident. So let's turn over to 1 Kings chapter 15. So Kings and Chronicles both give us the history of Judah. Um, Kings has a little more, or actually a lot more, about Israel in it than Chronicles does. Chronicles focuses more on Judah. Um, Kings is sort of historical. They didn't do historical studies and analysis like we do now. Um, But it was a chronicle of the kings of Judah and Israel and it focused on how they developed their relationship with God and how that played out in the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Chronicles play, considers more Judah, focuses on Judah and only considers Israel when it relates directly to Judah. And there's more of an emphasis there on the theological impact of the kingdom. So there's more of a focus on the kings and their relationship and how that impacts on the country. Chronicles has more of a, what's the actual spiritual nature of the kingdom? And focuses on the kings, but also on the priests and on the prophets and the relationship. So there's a bit of a different emphasis through the two books. So 1 Kings chapter 15. Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijam began to reign over Judah. He reigned for three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Abishalom, and he walked in all the sins that his father did before him. His heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Sounds like a completely different person to Chronicles, but this is the same king. Abijam. So this is father of the sea or father of the west. So it's literally father of the sea, but from the sort of context of how they use words, it would be implying everything from Jerusalem west to the sea. And so the peoples of the sea. And so the assumption is this is Abijam's actual name given to him by Rehoboam that you will be the father of the people of the West. You will restore the kingdom. Chronicles takes a spin on that and says, when you started as king, you relied on God. And we're going to call you Abijah, that you trusted in God, Yahweh, your savior and father. But yeah, contrast is quite stark between the two. That Chronicles gives us the story of the start of his reign and the emphasis of his faith and trust in God. Kings gives us what's your impact on the kingdom? And your impact on the kingdom is not very much because we're only going to give you eight verses. And the reason for that is because you didn't really wholly trust in God. 
you started well and fell away really quickly because he only lived for three years after he became king. He persisted in his father's sins. He didn't wholly commit to God. He won the battle, but then he fell into the same sins of his father and grandfather. He took many wives. It doesn't tell us what he does about the plunder and spoil from the battle, other than they captured a number of the border towns um, on the border between Israel and Judah. Um, but we were told that kings weren't to gather gold and silver for themselves. And we don't know what he did with that. But Abijam, Kings gives a much more bleak picture of him. And that for someone who started so well, he had a really short reign. Only about three years. God took his reign away from him very quickly. And if you contrast that with Jeroboam, Jeroboam lasted for about 21 years or 22 years. And then God took his reign away from him. We need to trust in God, not rely on our own strength, and then continue trusting and continue not relying on our own strength, not get caught up in I've done so well rather than God has used me. We need to humbly continue to follow, not let life or pride get in our way. So now let's look at his son. So let's go back to Chronicles. So Second Chronicles chapter 14. So Asa, after the deaths or death of Abijam, Asa becomes king. Asa is healer. So we're going to read, but you can see the summary there. Oh, he sounds like a healer. He restored worship of God. He restored the nation. So he's considered to be the first of the good kings of Judah. So from verse 1, Abijah slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his place. In his days the land had rest for ten years. And Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the foreign altars and the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the ashram and commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to keep the law and the commandment. He also took out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the incense altars, and the kingdom had rest under him. He sought God. He used his position to help the nation turn from idols. He destroyed idols. He destroyed the altars. He asked the people to turn to God. And God honored him. He gave them peace for 10 years. In verse 6, he built fortified cities in Judah, for the land had rest. He had no war in those years, for the Lord gave them peace. And he said to Judah, let us build these cities and surround them with walls and towers, gates and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him and he has given us peace on every side. So they built and prospered. And Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah armed with large shields and spears and 280,000 men from Benjamin that carried shields and drew bows. All of these were mighty men of valor. He used his time wisely. He sought God. He helped turn the nation to seeking God. 
God gave them peace. And then he used it. They built walls and towers and fortifications. He used his time wisely with what God had given him. He took the blessing and didn't just enjoy it, but used it. Verse 9, Zerah the Ethiopian came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots and came as far as Merashah. And Asa went out to meet him. And they drew up their lines of battle in the valley of Zephathah at Merashah. And Asa cried to the Lord his God, O Lord, there is none like you to help between the mighty and the weak. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Let not man prevail against you. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Asa and the people were with him, pursued them as far as Gerar, and the Ethiopians fell until none remained alive, for they were broken before the Lord and his army. The men of Judah carried away very much spoil, and they attacked all the cities around Gerar. For the fear of the Lord was upon them. They plundered all the cities, for there was much plunder in them. And they struck down the tents of those who had livestock and carried away sheep in abundance and camels. Then they returned to Jerusalem. So, a map, because we get a bunch of names, and it's sort of like, what's happening here? Um, so, as you can see in the map, if my pointer is not going to work, okay. Um, I have to drag a mouse across three screens. It's not always easy to get it right. Um, so we start in Jerusalem, and the Ethiopians are coming to attack. And so you can see in the bottom corner that the Ethiopians had quite a large kingdom. And moving up into Judah was their natural direction of expansion that they were following the spice route to basically conquer more land for prosperity. And so Asa brings the army to come against them. An army that is basically, again, half the size of the army he's facing. And they come to Merashah. And he aligns his army for battle. cries to the Lord. There is none like you to help. We rely on you. Let not man prevail against you. And God answers. But again, the Ethiopians fled. The Lord defeated the Ethiopians. And then not only did they flee, but the people followed them much further down and kept pursuing and defeating and plundering as they went. <coughs> He's defeated the Ethiopians. What is the response? That's the next chapter, verse chapter 15. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their distress they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, he was found by them. In those times there was no peace to him who went out to, or to him who came in, for great disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the lands. They were broken in pieces, nation was crushed by nation, and city by city, for God troubled them with every sort of distress. But you, take courage, do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. As soon as Asa heard these words, the prophecy of Azariah, the son of Oded, 
he took courage and put away the detestable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities that he had taken in the hill country of Ephraim. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the vestibule of the house of the Lord. He relied on God. He took his father's example. In his father's early reign, he went out to meet Jeroboam with an army half the size of what he was facing. Abijam prayed, relied on God, and God defeated Israel and gave them peace with Israel for that time. The Ethiopians came against Asa and the people of Judah. And Asa relied on God, just as his father, in the same circumstances of facing an army practically twice his size. He cries to God, and God answers. Oh, the carry-on, the next. They took great plunder. And coming back, a prophet comes out to them and says, God is with you if you will be with God. And Asa's response was, he took great courage from this and continued the spiritual reforms. He put away even more idols. He repaired the altar. He took away the idols from the lands of Ephraim, so the border areas of Israel that they had conquered under his father. So verse 10, they were gathered at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of the reign of Isa. They sacrificed to the Lord on that day from the spoil that they had brought, 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and with all their heart and with all their soul, but that whoever would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, should be put to death, whether young or old, man or woman. They swore an oath to the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with horns. And all Judah rejoiced over the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and they had sought him with their whole desire and he was found by them and the Lord gave them rest all round. So the implication is his response to God's victory was different to his father's. and possibly because of the prophet's intervention. But the prophet came out and said, God is with you. You need to stay with God. Asa heard. He took the message and understood and applied it. He continued the spiritual reforms. He continued getting rid of idols. And then when they get back to Jerusalem, they had taken great plunder. So what does he do? He provides a sacrifice. Out of that plunder, they had 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep that they made an offering to God. He turned the plunder over to God. And the people followed his example. That in some later kings and some later prophets we're going to read about the king may have done things but the people didn't always necessarily wholeheartedly go along but the people followed his example in verse 15 and all Judah rejoiced over the oath for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire and he was found his leadership brought about the first restoration, and revival in Judah. The people turn back to God. And God delivered his promise. He gave them rest. And then verse 16, even Maka, his mother, or his grandmother, King Asa removed from being queen mother because she had made a detestable image of Asherah. Asa cut down her image, crushed it, and burned it at the brook of Kidron. But the high places were not taken out of Israel. Nevertheless, 
the heart of Asa was wholly true all his days. And he brought into the house of God the sacred gifts of his father and his own sacred gifts, silver and gold and vessels. And there was no more war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa. That he delivered his tribute to God out of the spoils and plunders he had taken from God's victories. And God honored them. So this war was about the 10th year, and they had already had 10 years of peace until this war happened. And then we have another 25 years of peace. God honors <coughs> his commitment. And he says, the heart of Asa was wholly true all his days. So he sees God's deliverance. Unlike his father, there isn't that sense of pride and reliance on himself. He uses that to further his own zeal. He is inspired by seeing God's work in his life, and he continues to seek God. He continues to seek to be used as a king for God. And he continues his reformation. They get rid of more idols. They restore the altar. Except those high places, which are going to come back and be a problem. Ah. So he said, we had peace for another 25 years. Oh, his kingdom did last a little longer than that, so something else happens here. So 2 Chronicles 16, in the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Basha, the king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah that he might permit no one to go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. So Basha, I can't remember if he's a grandson or great-grandson of Jeroboam. <coughs> well, actually, no. Not a literal descendant, but a sec second or third king after Jeobo Jeroboam. Oh, he's going to repeat Jeroboam's sin. I'm going to try to prevent the people of Israel from going up to Judah to worship at the temple. They can see the success of Asa. They can see the people worshiping God. People will have been attracted and at other points, we're going to read about how, oh, yes, they were attracted. There were a large number of Israelites who had migrated to Judah during this period of time. So Basha says, I've got to do something about this. So he starts to build fortifications at Ramah, which is right on the border, on the route from basically almost any possible way of getting from Israel up into Jerusalem. So he's going to prevent people from going there. Oh, now, now, bad news. Verse 2. Then Asa took silver and gold from the treasures of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who lived in Damascus, saying, There is a covenant between me and you, as there, or, sorry. Yes. There is a covenant between me and you, as there was between my father and your father. Behold, I am sending to you silver and gold. Go break your covenant with Basha, king of Israel, that he may withdraw from me. And Ben-Hadad listened to the king Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they conquered Ijon, Dan, Adlamain, and all the store cities of Naphtali. So, up in the top half of that map. So, Asa forms an alliance with Syria. Syria already had an alliance of peace with Israel, but break it, and they come around in the north to attack and successfully attack and capture a lot of Naphtali at the northern tip of Israel. Verse 5, And when Basha heard of it, he stopped building Ramah and let his work cease. Then King Asa took all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timbers for, with which Basha had been building. And with them he built Geba and Mizpah. So that's basically bottom corner the exploded part of the map. So again, right on the border there between 
Judah and Israel on about the only route there was, um, or only easy route there was between Israel and Judah, that Basha had been building a fortress at a key strategic point, and Asa forms a political strategy to defeat him. He bribes the king of Syria. Oh, how does he do that? With the treasures from the house of the Lord. Oh, in the king's house, but treasures from the house of the Lord. Yes, we know this is not going to end well. The political strategy works. King of Syria says, oh, this is wonderful. Yes, I'll take this money. Yes, I'll go attack because not only do I get the bribe, but I also get a nice chunk of land because Israel's not prepared to be attacked in the <laughs> northern half. Their army is all set up in the southern part of their kingdom. So they very successfully attack. And then Basha has to take the army to go deal with the attack. And then Judah successfully manages to then destroy their fortifications and then use their own equipment and materials to build their own fortifications on the border. So from a political point of view, it was a very wise and successful strategy. Okay, we know this is not going to go well, don't we? Verse 7. At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped you. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. You have done foolishly in this, for, for from now on you will have wars. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison, for he was in a rage with him because of this. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at the same time. He didn't trust. His faith wavered at the end. Pride took over. First time a prophet comes to him, he hears the message and follows it with his heart. The second time a prophet comes to him, this would have been a time to repent. And he doesn't. He flies into a rage, throws the prophet in prison. Says and he inflicts cruelties on some of the people. So the assumption is those were the people who were probably supporting, murmuring, or arguing for the prophet's point of view. So verse 11. The acts of Asa from first to last are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers, dying in the 41st year of his reign. They buried him in the tomb that he had cut for himself in the city of David. They laid him on a bier that had been filled with various kinds of spices prepared by the perfumer's art, and they made a very great fire in his honor. So he was judged for his pride. The people weren't judged. His strategy was successful. God didn't say, the kingdom has fallen away from me. He said, you have fallen away from me. You have dealt foolishly. And when he didn't repent, God sent a disease to him. And he still didn't repent. He didn't seek God's help from the disease. There's an implication there that God would have healed him if he had repented and turned, but he didn't. He was judged. But the people remembered him well. 
He's one of the more spectacular funerals of the kings of Judah. That's because they had many years of peace under him. Reforms had taken place. So despite his failures at the end, the people still honored his memory for what he had done. We need to be fully committed that Abijam and Asa are to be examples that their kingships had significant impacts on the people. Asa had a dramatic influence on the lives of the people of Judah and probably set up a pattern that some of the following kings who also had restorations followed. But Abijam, it says, was not wholly committed to God. We need to be wholly committed. We shouldn't be half-hearted. We shouldn't have a religious obligation to following God. It needs to be a heartfelt, personal relationship with God. We need to last to the end. So Alan's comment when I was talking about this with him was, you need to finish well. You need to finish strongly, not falter at the end. That both of them started well. Asa continued well for years, decades. And they both finished badly. We need to trust God. They both trusted God in circumstances that were overwhelming and God delivered them. But Asa then didn't trust in the end. God will work through us if we trust and rely on him. Not to become proud, not to trust in our strength, but we are to be encouraged by it. We're to be emboldened by that. There are many examples of famous preachers, famous missionaries, who were emboldened because they did a little bit and God worked through them and they did more and they did more and every time they did more, they had greater faith and followed on. We need to be encouraged and be emboldened to do more. And we need to finish well. That our lives can be a legacy for others. So I said a few weeks ago that the intent of this series is the kings of Judah. Yes, there's all sorts of things about them as kings, but they were people like us with trials and tribulations like us. And they had the opportunity to follow God and trust in God like us. We need to see their examples. <coughs> Where did they fail? Where did they succeed? We need to rely on God, trust in God. He will work through us. He will use us. Let us be God's people. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you. <coughs> Throughout the Bible, you have provided us with guidance. You have provided us, us with messages, encouragement, and challenges, and warnings. We ask that you work in our lives. Help us to just see what your word has to say to us. Help us to understand how that's to work out in our lives. Help us to know what we need to do. Help us to have faith. You've said we can ask, and we ask that you would provide us with the faith to trust in you and rely on you. In Jesus' name, amen.